<clears throat> As Groucho used to say, well, that's me. <laughs> I, my friend Roger Guinevere Smith, we talked about microphones. You know, this could be karaoke. He said the microphone's gone out with him, but he still holds it because you can do all these things like, you know, and stuff like that. But <laughs> I'm sure one of the questions is, what about Greensboro? And I, I like it very much. And uh, the two things I might say about it is, from my window, it looks like an HO train layout. You know, it has all the charm that LA doesn't. And, and it even has a little train that goes through, <laughs> about the size of an HO train. And, and, and also, you guys are, don't have to have uh, front license plates. Pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, nothing ruins the look of a good looking car like a front license plate. <laughs> Not, not to mention, you, you know, we, the reason that it's a, a mandatory in L.A. is they have all these cameras. I think, have you heard about them? You know about them, the traffic lights? And, and, but they got into trouble. They had to, they had to, make, they had to back off because they kept taking pictures of people and they were with people they shouldn't be with. <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, with all that said, let's go with this thing. <clears throat> This is my first studio in Echo Park, and, and this was a photo that we took that you'll see recur. We, we took this by accident. This was my daughter's Halloween mask, and we, just, you know, we were goofing around, and, and it became an iconic photo because, you know, we're all, uh, the clown is sort of an everyman to me, and, and also, uh, you know, don't take yourself too seriously. And then this is the studio, you can see Echo Park. Uh, <laughs> I was there for 30 years, 25 years, and, and, and so EXP is also the, uh, the mark that gets on the wall and on my pottery around Echo Park. And I do a group of pottery that's uh, kind of, it's my idea of production. That means we make about a thousand mugs a year uh, for 40 years. Cool, huh? <laughs> yeah, and then, you know, miscellaneous other things. And uh, it became an idea of, uh, of an art pottery, not unlike Rookwood or Bauer or, or Cincinnati or some of the mm -hmm. others, but not quite, you know. So it's sort of a, I, I think now if I were, work, if I'd just gotten out of grad school, I'd call it an installation or a performance or something. You know, my, my friend, uh, there's my, my moniker, uh, my, my friend David Leonard got married and he's impulsively funny. So the minute he walked down the aisle, all, all his friends laughed. I think, you know, I mean, he sort of twisted his shoulders a little or something, and they went crazy. And, and the rabbi, a female rabbi at that, looked at him and said, now remember, David, this is a ritual, not a performance. <laughs> really threw him off his game. He couldn't even read his Hebrew. So that, that was Echo Park Pottery. Uh, and then here's some more of it. We, we work with a guy who's, well. <laughs> you see, inspiration. <laughs> yeah. And you know, where do you get your crazy ideas? So you see, even in here, there's the price. Uh, that was indiscreet. So, posters and you know all the things that go along with Echo Park pottery. So this is our our kind of classic Echo Park pottery teapot, and I consider this very conservative because the spout and the handle are on the same axis. You know, well, gets a little bit going, but there there they are. And this is a very funny thing because, as you see, my hair is fairly long in my beard. My, my daughter uh, opened a beauty sh salon. And uh, <laughs> so I, in the interim, I went down to Echo uh, Park and Sunset, you know, the crossroads. That was, uh, you know, Plato's crossroads. And, and I got a haircut for $10, haircut and beard trim. And she looked at me and said, oh, you've been cheating. 
<laughs> on her. She, she, so I, uh, I, and she said, and then she, you know, did what hairdressers do. She, you know, she kind of went like that. And, and she said, oh, it won't grow out well. <laughs> you know, that's like the curse, right? <laughs> so, so I, uh, so I, I, I said, well, I'm going to see about that, you know. So I went on for about a month. And then the, the salon still wasn't open. So I said, I'm not getting it cut until you're open, and I'm going to be the first haircut. So that went on for about five months. <laughs> these are the cups. And it's very funny because, you know, we did these... Uh, Partly because this is what I learned in school. I, I graduated as a, a ceramist from Chouinard Art Institute in 19... Um, uh, this is always funny. It would be, a, it would be you. <laughs> and uh, yes, yeah, so I, I graduated in, in the late, seven, uh, late 60s and was one of the last uh, graduating classes before it became Cal Arts, uh, <clears throat> And we learned to do a pottery sale, and, and I love that sort of Erstat's factory thing and, and our production. And, and so we made these, developed these cups, and, and then we stopped making them for a while. And I realized that uh, most of my friends couldn't afford my work. In fact, if I wasn't me, I couldn't afford it either. So I wanted to make things that everybody could have. And oddly enough, these darn things are in museum collections now, too. So go figure. So I, now I tell them, you better be careful. You've got to make these things well, because you don't know what they're, where they're going to end up. These are, and so there's a close-up of the canvas. And, and here we're going into the more uh, elaborate work that I sign. There's, so that, this, was a, this was a very early piece. I was looking at a lot of metal. In fact, my attack has always been very much like metal or wood uh, fabrication. This, one, <clears throat> this one's of interest to me. This came from a, a tale of my father-in-law's wedding. He said when they got married, th th no one had any money, and they all uh, baked a cake, but they baked part of it. They baked one layer and they all brought it and, and strung it on a broomstick to make it stand up. <laughs> so, you know, that's the principle here. This has a spine and, and all of these things are stacked up. Yeah, so, and uh, this one here uh, I thought was very funny because it's sort of a Mexican pot we work with a fellow named Benigno Barron, and I've been working with him for about 20 years, and he is a potter who's now 87, and he started in pottery as a seven-year-old in, in Guanajuato, Mexico. And so when people say, a five-decade a five career in art, well, he's got eight. And we always thought it was very funny because between us we had, uh, now we've probably got about 120 consecutive years of pottery experience. Uh, so he, at one point, I said, well, you know, make these pots, and, and, and I'd draw him a rough idea of, of the proportions, and then he'd ruffle them up and do all that, and then I'd add the spouts and, and trim with them on the bases. And then I made these sort of metal sculptures, because, you know, I've always subscribed to more is more. And uh, <laughs> so, so, I, again, I, this, this uh, little tag is where the signature is, because I figured, you know, everybody's such label whores these days, I'm going to put it on the front. In fact, my, my ceramic teacher, Ralph Becerra, got very upset one year, because he came and he said, you're signing it on the front? He you know, says, yeah, you know, let him see. The more teapots, and uh, this one modeled loosely after planters' peanuts, and, you know, there's no success like excess. Uh, I don't know what else to say. These are peaches, and, and I, uh, I get to combining the materials, as you see. And I am a, a sort of a toy maker, and I think that that's what you all responded to, and that is that 
uh, oh, it, was, it was great. I, there was, there was a very, uh, uh, very important collector woman who shall remain nameless. And she said, well, explain your work. And I said, well, for me, every time I open the kiln, I want to feel like Christmas. You know, it's like toys. It's like the feeling you get about toys and really having something that, that excites you in the morning. You know, you know it's, like, it's like that new pair of shoes that you go to sleep with by your bed so you can wake up looking at them or something. Oh, she thought I was as dumb as a rock. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it wasn't an art explanation. And, and, and it was very funny a, a couple of years later to hear her explaining my work that way as though she had thought it up. Well, that's what you get. And then, it, you know, it goes into the impossible. That's the other part, is how ridiculous and kind of, uh, uh, as the, one of the Italians said to me, well, where does the tea stay? <laughs> <laughs> so this one, you know, it can, it's sort of this sewer pipe of, uh, oh, it's, it's wacky, huh? It had terrible commercial success with that one. <laughs> and this one, <laughs> this one, <laughs> Guernica. So you see these things and, it's hard to describe them quickly, and we don't have a lot of time. This, again, is my uh, sort of bolted together stacking idea. So we've, we've struggled mightily to um, at least make air pass through the whole thing, <laughs> if nothing else. And there's that guy. This is the teapot that Sotsas saw published. And this is sort of a result of my first voyage to Italy. You know, cathedrals and, and colonnades. And, and this, this piece we put at the head of this section because I did this in 1977 and I thought uh, that it was a real um, indication of my drive towards metal and towards the articulation of metal. And the way that I had to make this darn thing was upside down and, and fire it upside down so it would be strong enough to hold itself up. So here's <laughs> back in the studio, <laughs> and, and, and we like the, you know, you see a lot of people like the bozo wig, so that, that's my chair in Ruthless People. Now that was put in there to show what a neurotic Bette Midler was, <laughs> but she's so personable, it came out the other way, so it was very nice. And these, this is a group of uh, chairs that I've done over the last uh, five or six years our tool bin. This, uh, these, these are uh, takes on some of the Memphis works. There's a famous chair. This was my first work for Memphis. And, and all of these things start with a, a drawing to, to sort it out and to keep track of uh, the ideas as they're coming. There's a, this is about a trip to the seashore. And again, we're, we're attempting to make these things as p impossible as we could. <laughs> That's a funny photo. This is uh, Garrett Reitfeld goes to the pool. Slow me down if I'm going too fast. But this is um, a work we did for the uh, former ambassador to England, Richard Tuttle. This is his office. So over the, uh, my, my friend Mary Norris, uh, was good, good friends with him and had me make a table for his first uh, outing as Secretary of Transportation for uh, 42 or 41. And then, and then we did this sofa last year, the beginning of the year. Uh, for, and there's Mary sitting in it so you get an idea of the scale of the thing. That's quite something, huh? That was a mega work. Uh, mm -hmm. Coffee table for a uh, a dear friend in Pasadena. And this section is, is a group of glass work that I did over the years in Murano with uh, Mauro Albarelli. So, th and this is the industrial crisis here. You know, every, it's the, you know, I don't know how many of you have been up close to a gondola, but they're like, they're like fragile seashells. They, you know, they just crush if you cough on them. And, uh, and so I, I have this uh, crazy torso hauling the uh, city hall up. And, you know, and it's always about these impossible impos cranes and things that don't attach to anything. And, and then the uh, 
the lagoon, the surrounding of the lagoon, Venice Mestri, the kind of industrial horror. Uh, and there, so there you see the, some of the works and their drawings. The way that we were making these is I would make life-size drawings and then uh, they'd pin them up next to the furnace and simply make them off my drawings. And we developed a whole uh, group of um, attachments. So then they, and then I said, God, I want to really make some of this really, you know, I want to do the work really in a fragile Venetian way. And they said, no, you can't. We, we, you know, he had this idea of really coming back into America with it. So I went out and I, I just placed a bunch of the things on top of one of them. There you go. And it always comes back to the same thing. We got to get through this. So what? <laughs> we did 179 different pieces in this group. And then in this group, we did 15. This is uh, the sculpture section. This is in uh, Elysian Park. This was done in 92 as a gazebo. And we planted the palm tree. This is uh, Santa Monica Boulevard, where uh, the two words. This is in, yeah. <laughs> what, what can you do? Burbank, Lockheed, former Lockheed site. A little mixed up. Uh, this is uh, Department of Transportation. Uh, they're kind of their control center. So we did these with roads. Uh, and this is the work in Japan for Sapporo Beer, uh, Hok uh, Hokkaido Electric. And uh, we did this in, I think, 91 and 2. And this uh, has LEDs in the uh, cross hatching on the body. So that was an early, early outing. Uh, my current studio. And uh, here we are in. Uh, the Merchant and Farmers Bank in 4th and Main, downtown LA, allegedly the most filmed location in the world, kind of can be, the, the, you know, this guy keeps a, a bank building on the corner of 4th and Main because it just rents constantly for the movies. And it can be anything. It can be Kansas, it can be a bank, it can be, a, you know, these angels. This is, I made these for the Metro. Uh, this is a study for the transportation, uh, Encino Public Library. This is what happened to the metro, joint development. Those are my skylights and benches, or what's left of them. Uh, this is in uh, the Academy, Screen Actors Guild. This, this sculpture I traded for a car. I'll show it to you later. There's, uh, these are the studies for these pieces. And, and this was about suburban Burbank, the fountain in Japan. <coughs> this is in the Colburn School for Music, and it's a chandelier that incorporates Venetian glass. This is Metro Center, tile work that uh, you get the idea. This is Home Depot in Los Angeles. This, you know, this fellow uh, was, he funded it himself. And uh, the, uh, don't get me started about the public art world in LA. Uh, so, so here, it's got all these tools. And my friend claims, who's now the head of the Library Foundation, he comes down this street to work and he, he claims that every morning the various guys that are waiting f to be picked up for work stand under the appropriate tool for their trade. <laughs> <laughs> So this work I did along with the big sculptures in Japan, and uh, we left it there for 18 years. And, and when everything um, happened in 2008, we got a call from our friend and said, did you hear they've gone bankrupt? And she arranged for me to come and pick them up, and, and, uh, and I went to Japan and picked these things up. This is in my studio. And this this um, group of work that you're about to see a lot of, is own, owned by the fellow who did this little presentation. So he got to put in all of them. It all, there's what it looks like around our studio. And there's the work in, in place. 
they built this wonderful house. See what I mean? This was my, uh, this was, is by Jim Hyman. Acme pens. These, um, <clears throat> this was a group of seven uh, tables and this is what I called submarine art because they wanted it all to fit in together in this compact thing and then they all, they're all in little rollers so they can be put around the room. This is uh, again in Burbank at Lo what was formerly Lockheed. Uh, this in studio, a fountain with a wind. And this is the cartoon for tile work on a sculpture. This is uh, one instance of sculpture with, uh, you know, putting the tiles. This is a mailbox for uh, one of the foremost teapot collectors in the world, Sonny and Gloria Cam. They wanted a teapot for a mailbox. Uh, again, chandeliers, this Hollywood Boulevard. Um, <clears throat> I, there's so much to say about all of these things. Here's a close-up of your sculpture. And there it is. And I'm going to stop on it in a couple of slides with the night view. See, I, even I work sometimes, Jim. Uh, so I, <clears throat> Let's talk about this thing so you all can say, well, what did he mean? <laughs> this, this sculpture, uh, this group of works uh, started with two of uh, my friend's um, children, uh, Gordon Davidson, who is, was the director, artistic director of the Mark Taper Forum, a collector of art and awards. His house is festooned with both. And uh, his children came to me and said, well, we, we want to give them an anniversary present, and we have $1,000. Well, I figured that was like a lot of people coming to me and saying, I have $100,000. So I s wanted to really do something somehow. And I'd, I had bought um, two bundles of this really unusual material. It's a very thin wall tubing, so the corners are very square. So I'd been wondering what to do with it. And I thought, well, this is, I'm going to do two things. One is I'm going to get the, th how am I doing for time? I said, sure. The, uh, I'm going to get a way to get height so it has some scale without a lot of work. So of course, the, the you know, the this is sort of a table. The, you know, the, the one that I did for them only had four legs, and it, it was a tall table. I got it up about seven or eight feet. And then we're going to put a little top knot on it that's, that's really the intense part of the sculpture. And, and that's a, uh, a symbol and a, uh, a metaphor, maybe even an allegory, that I've been working with for a while that's a unicyclist on a wire. And, and Gordon had been particularly um, intrigued with that because uh, this is the balance, you know, the show flops, but it's, it also becomes, um, or it succeeds, but it also becomes this funny idea of balance and uh, morality, you know, or choices, thing, one thing on one side, one thing on the other. And, and if it goes out of balance, you're for it. So I, uh, I, I had a little guy up there, and this was a, a theme that I'd been kind of fussing with because I love this movie called The Wreck of the Merry Deer, which is one of these really weird movies that's, you know, the, the sort of thing you hope to find in the video store in the dollar section, you know, a movie that you've never heard of that's really great. And I had actually seen it as a youth at the local theater called the Ramona. And I saw it again on this, and I thought, I'm going to watch it. I remember it was pretty, pretty interesting. And there was a Gary Cooper movie filmed in England, probably almost one of his last, if not his last, and Charlton Heston's first. And then uh, this fantastic British supporting uh, um, cast with, uh, with Redgrave, Michael Redgrave doing a, a walk-on and so forth. And, and it's this tank shots of this tramp steamer 
uh, that are just amazing. And you know, you know, it's one of those things where if you're watching closely, you see see the whole wall shake and when they've closed the bulkhead doors and stuff. And 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 but these shots are just the greatest tank shots. And the Tramp steamer is such a great sort of mystery ship, and it's this wreck. And and I was feeling pretty. Um, sometimes you know we're broke. Sometimes we, you know, we're kind of wondering what we're doing and, and that was one of them. And I had this whole um, sequence where I, I must have watched the darn thing about 20 times. I'd watch it in the middle of the night when I couldn't sleep. And then I got on to drawing this, because they, you know, that seems so clear what the boat is, but they only show it for a few seconds. So I'd keep watching it and I was drawing it and I figured out how it was constructed. And then I started doing these drawings and the drawings were, were the steamer, the tramp steamer being shoved onto the rocks. And I had this um, sort of guardian and he was the guy uh, up on a, not unlike when you see tennis matches in the old days and they had this sort of a riser or lifeguard stations that are sort of a, of a riser. And, and that, that became this understructure. And the guy, instead of on a wire, was holding the balance while he was in a chair. And then uh, it has this whole upward thrust. And as a, as a potter, we really work on the, on the float. And that's to say that most, if you look at pots, they've got a foot and then they taper up. Even if they're a little round, they often taper because you don't want it to visually sink. You want it to float. So this is a very reverse of that. It's a, pa it's a strength structure. It's a tripod or a, or a sort of Thebian uh, rustico. And then the, the paddles of the guy on the top take, you know, became bigger as they went down also to, to really give the piece some presence. And from there, it all went in the toilet. No, <laughs> from there, it went. To, <laughs> from there, it all, all became very, you know, we kept going. And we you know, added six legs. And, you know, and they got up to whatever, 10 legs or 15 legs or whatever's on that. And I started doing something that has been coming in and out of my work, which is creating volume through flat planes. And so that, that you, know, you can see how that's working with the paddles on top of each other in this case. And then, of course, we had this fantastic sort of frontal piece. So I, and I've got little ladders on it to, you know, to really shift the scale and, and, and even carry you up there, especially the youngsters, you know, they'll, they'll move into a thing like that and go, oh, a little guy could climb up there. And I've got the little guys up there. And, and then I shifted the whole upper structure at, to 180 degrees. And, and so that was to look at the way it would go in the round. And uh, what's, so what's happening is the little guy, there is a little guy seated, a little guardian, but there's a whole bunch of other guys that are, are sort of doing uh, acrobatics. And so you see this guy's up here, and, and, and what this became to me again is, is an idea of, um, uh, of ascension or transcendence. And of course, we know that the, uh, you know, the American scene with Thoreau and Emerson and all were very uh, much based on uh, transcendence and, uh, and, and the American scene in general is one of uh, optimism and, and rising. And so, and I, I subscribe to that, uh, and especially in my own life, because I was such a screw up in school. <laughs> but anyway, my, I, I saw my friend's mother at the drugstore. We were getting our flu shots. Well, I'd known him since we were 13, and she looked at me and she said, well, you didn't turn out so bad after all. <laughs> and I, yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, you got to take it if it's so. And, and, uh, and I said, uh, yeah, you know, I've been sort of kidding myself about that because, you know, my wife wouldn't have looked at me in high school. And she thought about it. And she said, oh, yes, she would for shock value. <laughs> <laughs> so you get the picture. So, you know, and then, so it's got these things and the ladders go up. You know, and the, la and the, uh, um, the birds are, are taking off.
They're, everything's ascent, you know, going up. They got this funny strength funnel where it's like an hourglass. And um, the, other, uh, the other thought that came with that was from a movie called uh, Tom Popo, where the young woman says to her friend who's helped her to make a fantastic noodle bar you know, to, to ascend, and she said, well, you've given me my ladder. We all have a ladder that we can choose to climb or not within our capabilities and our, our, our life. So there's a brief explanation, or maybe a long one, I don't know. <laughs> These are uh, studies for color on furnitures. These, this is uh, how these things go. There's my hobby truck. And th this, is, um, this is the house that my parents built in 1950 with an architect named Joseph Vandercar. And there's, it's, this, uh, this piece was published in um, World of Interiors. That's where it was. My, my uh, wife and I live in it now, not unlike Dick and, and Jane. It sounds like a, like a reader, doesn't it? <laughs> and, uh, this is, so this is how it turned out. So, so there's sort of a funny story where you go, well, where did it all come from? Well, you know, this is what I grew up with. And, and I, don't know if it, I'm not, I don't know if it shows, oh, but the garden was done by a guy named Garrett. He didn't take pictures of the garden, but the garden was done by a guy named Garrett Ekbo. And what he did was he took the mullions for the patio, the, the, you know, the little squares, and did them at a diagonal. So that whole idea was pretty present, you know, all through growing up. So you think, oh, yeah, you know, I'll just put this at an angle and blow everybody's mind. <laughs> Lo and behold, there's the car I traded for, which, <laughs> yeah. Uh, how's that? This is a uh, hot rod menorah. <laughs> my canoe and my friend. This is, uh, this is something my dad, my dad made that skull when he was in art school. So we keep it here and it's a bit of a memento mori, isn't that? But it ends up as a clown in my studio. And there we are, ready to go, Re coming back from canoeing. So th there you have it. Thank you very much.